Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and if you're looking for dedicated teams, autonomous teams, and clarity in responsibilities, then this episode is for you. Joining me today is Sergio Beaumont. He's a principal agile consultant over here at Xibia, and you'll recognize him from episode two way, way back. I'll put all his links to his socials in the description below. Check him out. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. I went to one of these people and said, uh, how many how many projects are you working on? Like one, two? And he laughed at me. He said, well, one, 20. Yeah. And that was a consistent thing. So I started interviewing more and more people and they all had 20 projects. Now, the, how? That's insane. Yeah, it is. But that's just the way it worked because everybody, because they didn't, and that's really, you could say a product owner problem at the higher level. For instance, with the three projects, yeah. higher level product ownership would then say, okay, we're going to do this one project now and the other two have to wait. So exactly. all of them are faster. But that does mean that you have to say to two other stakeholders or whatever, like you're going to have to wait for a while. And that what you see a lot is that then the management at that level doesn't have the, um, doesn't have the strength of character mm. to say, okay, we're going to do project number one. And we're not going to do project number two and three. So the people pay the price. Yeah. Is the is the thought process there that if they do all of the projects kind of similarly, that their the value that they add would be faster? Because why would someone just initialize even three projects at the same time when one is clearly more important? Or even if it's not more important, you still would add value more if you focus on one project, no? Well, the problem that is that that it isn't clear. Mm. The problem is um, one of those things is once you do start going into that other direction and saying, let's just assume fixed teams, let's see how much they're loaded. I've seen so many times that then, even if it's just a stupid wall of stickies and you put it all on the wall and show it then, is that all of a sudden, even like one of the worst cases I had was like a team, like very smart people, like six people, yeah, fully in like Excel country, constantly collecting hours of people that were they were writing, uh, doing a lot of complicated calculations, reports, and all that kind of things. Yeah. And still, it wasn't clear what the total load on the teams was. Wow. So it's a very complicated puzzle to do. And then when we did the whole, okay, let's make some fixed teams. Let's see how far they uh, how far they can go. The, pro- the team started projecting out how much they could do. Mm. And everybody said, well, yeah, this is pretty clear. We won't make it this year with all the plans we had. Yeah. And it was sort of a sad moment for those six because they were like, why are we even here, right? Yeah. And so, um, and so, yeah, that's that's a part. Of course, we one we had to explain like you're you're basically trying to make a fundamentally difficult puzzle. You're trying to do that. You're trying to calculate progress based on simple fact of I'm doing an activity. Yeah, right. It's just like you know, if, like in agile, if you say like in the definition of done. I have tested. Oh, great. You've done the activity of testing. Does that prove anything? No. Was the test successful? Is it actually? So it's kind of similar to that. So simply the fact that you're that you're describing the fact or you're writing down your hours, I did an activity, I burned hours, you have no sense of if that was actual progress. Exactly. And so, and that's also actually with my current customer, they're exactly the same thing. Yeah. All their data is all hours burned Activities. simply people did stuff yeah well and then you ask the question but do are you having progress well that's sort of an indirect measure right you're assuming that if you spent 80 of your burned 80 hours on a project that you had 80 hours of pro- pro- progress that's rarely the case yeah so that's also why it turns out that sort of the agile way of looking at it because well we don't care how many hours you burned what was the actual progress exactly since that's the only thing, and the actual empirical proof of seeing like a version of a product or something like that, that it's su- it's surprisingly powerful, mm. and so that's also one of the things we have to teach them. So sometimes it's even the case that, yeah, sure, it's a lot more complicated and sort of intellectually cooler thing to do all the existing uh, stuff they have because there often are more complicated uh, calculations and data. Yeah. And then we come in with this very dumb idea and go Simplified. like, yeah, just, just show the thing. Yeah. And everything is, is discounted into that. And they go like, it's that simple? Yeah, yeah, it's that simple. It, that, it can't be that simple. It, it actually is. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's that's what I think organizations often have to get used to. Yeah. yeah. yeah interesting. But I mean, I've been in teams where, first of all, my time is split during meetings and I, I don't even know if I need to be here. Or I would ask myself, like, do I really need to be here? 
regardless of if the meeting is effective or not effective, yep. right? It's just about the topic and my role within that team. But if someone is in that team, how do you get out of that team and, and really just focus on the core of what you are there for in a team? Can you do that from within the team or does someone from outside of the team really need to help in that aspect? Mm. In my experience, um, and this goes to, you know, again, you know, what we're sitting here for actually, you know, what makes an effective team, right? Yeah. One of those core things is, um, in this sense, a team is a team by grace of a common goal. Mm. That's one of the big ones. So uh, you're saying like, what is my, how do I know my personal uh, contribution to the team? Well, I'd say that is irrelevant or not irrelevant. It is, it's only of a second order importance yeah. to what, what does the whole team need to do? Because everything you need to do, you should be able to ask yourself, doesn't matter what I do, I could be doing anything. I could be getting coffee. I could be you know, making, flipping burgers for my team or doesn't matter as long as if I know what the team's goals are, mm. does it contribute to that? Yeah. So that is the more important thing. And so one of the things I've been doing nowadays and I've been really looking into sociocracy nowadays, mm -hmm. one of the things that is in sociocracy because we're all equal together. Yeah. And so how do we make sure that we sort of make agreements on who does what without somebody being the boss? So the nice thing of, of therefore of sociocracy is that it's, it has more tools to make those agreements mm. and make them explicitly. Yeah. And one of them is domain definitions. And in, I use uh, sociocracy uh, 3.0, so it's, it's shortened to S3. They always call it S3. Okay. And in S3, uh, there is a thing called the delegation canvas. And it yeah. basically describes, okay, if, if you have a group or a role or whatever it may be, what is its purpose? What is its core purpose? What are its responsibilities? If it would be you're sort of delivering products of any kind, what are they? And so you clearly define uh, what those boundaries are, who yeah. are you and who are you not? And when the whole team sees that, they see, ah, so this is what we, we together are responsible for. Let's say, you know, maybe they're a PMO team and they're responsible for providing a report to the executives. Mm. So they know who their beneficiaries are, they need to know what their, what their execs, their beneficiaries are trying to achieve, so their goals. Then they know their own purpose, like our purpose is to make sure that our execs can make decisions or something like that. Yeah, That's our core purpose. Okay, therefore what are your responsibilities? That at all times certain information is available or something to that effect, you can write that down. And the products may be, you know, we provide our, our, our execs with this and this and this and this report. So, do people align on that when they when they have those discussions on purpose and responsibilities? Well, the the fun thing is that the canvas is actually the the tool with which you do the discussion. Mm. So it's it's very often it's a delegation. That's also why it's called a delegation canvas, right? So normally, if we're still in a hierarchical organization, or you you see sort of the outside circle, like yeah. the overall organization, then hands uh, a smaller group um, power. Maybe with a, with another example. Let's say we are together in a larger group. Mm -hmm. uh, we're friends. We are all equal, and we're in a group of like ten people. Yeah. And uh, we all agree, sort of together. Somehow we come with the idea. Let's let's ha let's have a night out together. And then um, and then we all know that if all of ten of us are going to organize that, that you know it would it's not, not make work. sense. Not going to work. So. Uh, so then the whole group basically look at each other and go like, Patrick, you're, you're good at organizing stuff. Mm. Why don't you do it? So uh, we're, we're okay if, uh, if, you, uh, if you organize the venue, yeah. where we're going to eat, what we're going to do. Uh, but I think it's good that, but we think it's good if, if all of us agree on the price first. So, you know, you talk with each other, let's say, okay, 50 euros, that's the maximum budget we have. Now, all of a sudden, something magic happens sort of in that sociocratic method. The group... Together, we were sort of the people in power together, yeah. and we handed you some power. So we magically agreed upon the fact that you have a constraint of 50 euros per person. Yeah. We have given you the power to decide and saying your responsibility, but also therefore sort of a power that we hand over to you because we chose to do so, is uh, you're out, you, you choose the venue, you choose the restaurant, stuff like that. Yeah. So it's not so much about sort of who has the power, but that ability to to basically hand it over to somebody as yeah. a group and say here it's yours now because now you are god emperor of the meat of that of that party because we but we chose to do so so it's not the case that in these systems 
um, that there is no person who has final power over something. It's how did we come to the distribution of it? Yeah. And so those canvases basically do the same thing. A manager comes in or a group comes in or whatever. They have, they sort of, they hold a big pie of power, of decision power, of responsibilities, whatever it may be. And then you negotiate with each other. Mm. Is this a responsibility or not? Are we allowed to do this or not? Is this a thing we're going to be doing for you or not? And then you gain a lot of clarity. And what the nice thing is that the team then knows, okay, this is who we are, this is who we are not. Yeah. Let's say uh, they are responsible for, for instance, create that PMO group. We create that report, that's us. It also means that we, uh, for instance, ha get to decide what the final structure of the report is, but we are accountable to our beneficiaries, the execs. So it's, we're doing it for them, so they should be happy about it. And so, uh, but for instance, the tooling, like let's say, uh, who, who chooses that, Yeah. right? So it could very well be that you explicitly state, well, as a PMO group, you are allowed to choose your own tooling, but, constraint, it must fit within the infrastructure and it should be able to hostable within the infrastructure of our company. Yeah. So for instance, it must, you must be able to run it on Azure or something like that, right? So, um, and that's I think where this magic tends to happen is that you very, very rarely actually I found that teams are completely clear about what that boundary is. Who I can are imagine. we? Yeah. What systems do we own? What are we allowed to say yes or no? Um, do we overlap with another team with respect to responsibility? Yeah. Even if that's the case, right, it can still be an explicit choice, but then you can say, well, okay, good that we know it, because every time we make that type of decision, we better communicate with the other team. Interesting. And so I think, I fully believe, and I've done it many times, once you have those things negotiated, and maybe another example with, uh, with another customer I had, the manager of the design uh, department mm. had they wanted to restructure themselves in, an, in a different way uh, according to sort of like a very high level sort of a process of making sort of the high level designs. Uh, there was a group that was much more geared towards taking those overall designs and customizing them, but also executing on them as they were building things. Yeah. And uh, another group that was very, very much around general standards, uh, but also, okay, it's nice that you have a design because it actually was a design for, uh, for hotel rooms and things like that. Uh, where do you get, you know, if you're going to build hotels across the world, where do you going to get your toilets? Yeah. Right, for instance, I mean, it's nice that you have a design for it, which is generic across the the whole brand, but you know, we probably can't get the same toilets in Europe as in the United States. So that's what we uh, did. So what the manager then did, she agreed, and we had a clear discussion around what does the whole department do? What yeah. is the whole department's responsibility? So we had a canvas for that. And then the subgroups, they each had a, their leader. So first we made some drafts with the leader about sort of what their responsibilities were, how they did they fit within the whole. And then we brought in everybody else. And there was some very interesting discussions. So the whole group, so the sub three sub departments could look at the list of responsibilities for the whole department and saying, are we covering everything? Yeah. So one of the things they found was, hey, wait a minute, there's a responsibility up there for a department that nobody is covering. So those were things they found. Another thing they found was that, oh, wait a minute, uh, there's overlap or there were gaps, things like that. But also, hey, wait a minute, if we are going to be executing on the responsibilities as one of those sub teams, we need you guys. So we'd like you guys to take on the responsibility to make sure you always have this type of information available to us. Yeah, exactly. And then hand it to us. So by the time that whole negotiation was done, literally every team member said, I'm so happy, I know who I am now. Mm. I know where I'm part of. I'm very clear on what my team needs to do. And then you can trust, because that's basically all the things we've been doing with Agile teams all over the place, through things like daily stand-ups and, uh, and, and other make techniques, uh, your, your backlog items, they'll figure it out. Yeah. What do I need to do today to get to the team's goals and to achieve the team's responsibility? Exactly. I mean, it's it's clarity on an organizational level or on a unit level, however you may see it. Anything, right? But even on the, the team levels that are below that, that contribute to that common goal. That, yeah. That's, that's incredible. And I use it at every level. So if it's, if it's really needed, I rarely use it at the personal level because it's you don't really need it. And also you want to avoid it a bit because otherwise people sit in their activity boxes, right? I'm a tester, I'm only going to do this thing, right? yeah. things like that. So you want to avoid that. 
But definitely, if you have teams of teams of teams of teams of teams of teams, kind of that sort of a hierarchical structure, a nested structure of teams, yeah, um, you can use it at any level. So you can use it at the team level, the team of teams level, and if the teams of teams is part of a department, then the department. And it's been a very powerful tool. I mm. really like it. What if the people in those teams say, well, I, I know now what the team responsibilities are, but I've always actually had a different set of responsibilities. Probably they went out of the way to gain those responsibilities because <laughs> they probably wanted to be in that other team. Uh, that's, um, I haven't actually encountered that very much, like people mm. having fought for certain responsibilities. I think what people want the most is to be useful, to be effective, and to have sort of an impact on the world. Yeah. The specific responsibilities that come with it tend not to be as important as that. Okay. What I do find, and it's also why connected to that delegation canvas, I have a whole thing that I call the sanitization canvas, where you basically go through the whole process. And indeed, one of the things you find, and it's one of the things we uh, we go through, is then once you have done that, that every team member basically figures out, okay, you know, first, of course, are we really on the team or am I just a stakeholder or just somebody who provides some information? So when there's clarity, okay, this is really the core team. Yeah, what's the border? Then we ask every single team member, given that you know here on this canvas, these are all the responsibilities of the team and you have a whole bunch of things to do. Okay. What other things do you have that you are responsible for or somehow are expected to do in any way, shape or form Yeah, that is not on that list? Probably like a whole slew. Yeah. It really depends. Some people have nothing. Some people have a whole bunch of things, but they all write it down. So basically we make a sort of a matrix of we write down a per row, like a person puts their name up and then they write down you just to put stickies like you know, here. Yeah. This is all my responsibilities. And then you get a pretty clear picture on truly how dedicated that team can be. And then we go through another process because, of course, it is very unprofessional to just drop everything. Like, <laughs> exactly. Like, no, not doing that anymore. Goodbye. Yeah. So, yeah, that responsibility has to land somewhere. So then we plan it out and basically say, okay, this responsibility, so you're actually also responsible for that other report or you should be at that other meeting. And then there's a whole discussion like, should that does it make sense for that responsibility to, to actually be adopted by the team? That could mm. be one option, right? So yeah. Then you continue doing it, but very often it's more like, no, wait a minute, that responsibility you're doing right now actually belongs to another team. Yeah. And again, that's where the clarity comes in because then they clearly see, hey, wait a minute, what I'm doing here is actually now that team's responsibility. So let's have a negotiation over it, and then it could be just a straight handover. But sometimes. I've seen it also often is with um, a, a handover with sort of an apprenticeship. So then you put on your, both of the team's backlogs, you put sort of an apprenticeship backlog items yeah. where one team member hands it over to another team member. Uh, so that's another variant. I've also seen variants where the conclusion is it does not belong to our team, mm. but to hand it over would be much more work than the remaining work of you know what still needs to be done. Yeah, finishing like, it. You know, finishing it. Let, let's just finish it. So sort of a short-term adoption. And we know it's not really our work, but you know we do it, we finish it, and then it's it's gone forever. Yeah. So that's also a variant I've seen. And finally, sort of the defer or kill, because it's like, well, you know, we don't actually when we think about it, it actually doesn't make sense that we're doing it at all. So yeah. let's just not do it anymore. Um, and so th that's also what I use. That's uh, what what I then call the sanitization canvas for. And then we sort of plan out basically how do we do the whole end over. And then you start really cleaning up the work of all the people, yeah. handing over responsibilities that they shouldn't be having so that the team in the end can be at, the, at least for any team you want to function you want them to be sort of dedicated towards that goals and the responsibilities of that team for at least 80 percent 90 percent because otherwise you're so distracted yeah it just doesn't work that's the importance but I, I think people will then realize if this is the team for them because if i look at my own journey i would be in a team and i would be like oh that team is doing real cool stuff i would go to my manager and be like can I help them? Can I like gain responsibilities in that team? And that's probably how I would get so many like different team aspects on my plate that I would feel responsible for. But that is a result of being like proactive or entrepreneurial or however you want to call it. And I can see then from a delegation point of view, like if you have team leads or even managers and people come up to you and want to help, it's easy to then distribute that work also across team. But then you get the like bunched up mess and it's not it's not really clear anymore who's responsible for what even on a team level because everyone's kind of doing everything and if everyone's doing everything then nothing's getting done in a good manner i think yeah so 
I think one note, based on what you're saying, like, you know, for, for instance, you said, if I personally step up and I personally get this, one of the things that's also very important in this way of thinking is that there is a very, we, uh, that's actually a term I took from holacracy, which is one of those variants in the sort of the sociocratic method. Yeah. Uh, is They call it role versus soul. Mm. And everything we were just discussing about the responsibilities, it, it, they're all hats. They're never connected to people. Yeah. So all the all the discussions that you have around, okay, here is a set of responsibilities, and, that, and we call that a domain, right? It's just a set of stuff. Here is a combination, sort of a package of yeah, responsibilities. Like planning. And, no, not planning, but more like it's just a package of power yeah, or a package of responsibilities, and it comes with a whole, like, uh, but you connect it to something. Now, we're, we tend to connect it to a person and saying, here, that's yours, and it becomes your job function. And then you go, you go to HR, you change your job function. But that's a much too strict connection. One of the things we want to do in this kind of system, just like a scrum master role and a product owner role, right? It's not specifically, or it should not be specifically attached to a person. Actually, that's one of the mistakes I also go against a lot, mm. is that also the product owner role is a role. If you implement it, yes, there is one person who needs to have the final say over the ordering, but I've had many implementations where the actual implementation of the product owner role was a political heavyweight, mm. to, say a lot, to say no a lot. Yeah a UX person because the whole thing was so UX heavy you needed the expertise to actually sort of figure out like where do we want to go with respect to the UX and somebody was very heavy in information analysis for instance yeah because like a BA, like a BA person like the three of them were needed to actually you know make the product owner role work well then you have three people sharing and working on the hat the role didn't change yeah. the product owner role didn't fundamentally change so the same thing with these things is that it's not like if you do renegotiation of roles, you're basically attaching, you're, you're basically putting a lot of hats on the table and saying, oh, you know, essentially, if you would make, make it a visual, you would have a bunch of hats and you have a bunch of responsibilities and you write down a responsibility on a sticky and then you move it from one hat to the next. Yeah, That doesn't mean you got the responsibility, that hat got the responsibility. Exactly. And you're only taking on the mantle of those responsibilities when you put on the hat. But that doesn't mean it's your job function. Because yep. maybe two months later, it turns out that you know f maybe you're going on a long holiday, and it's better if I take over your work. Yeah, then I put on the hat. It didn't change my job function. Exactly. Just to, to, I took on the mantle of the responsibility for a while, and so when we're talking about governance in that sense, that's what we're talking about. Governance is just talking about hats all the time, mm. and what are the responsibilities? And essentially, the team hats are very big hats. They're yep. so big that you need like seven people to actually, you know, make sure everything happens. And if you have a whole department, the hat is so big, you need multiple teams to implement it. Yeah. But there's still hats. There's just the responsibilities, et cetera. So when, when people talk about taking responsibilities or moving it, in this type of conversation, it's always not me taking the responsibility. It's the wider discussion of, I'm wearing a hat right now. Yeah. Should my hat have the responsibility? And then later, if I ever take the hat off and give it back to you, it comes with that attached responsibility. It never was attached to me. Interesting. But then people people always glue like responsibility and accountability closely together. But I can still be accountable if I delegate the responsibility of doing yeah, something to that's, you. That's also an interesting discussion because also in, in the use of the word responsibility and accountability, yeah. the word gets flipped a lot. Yeah. So let's just, I'm choosing one of the definitions that I like a lot and I also took it a bit from S3. So a responsibility is the fundamental nature of a thing it needs to be done. Yeah, the act of doing something. The hat has a responsibility to it. Let's say, you know, there's a hat that says, uh, you know, you're a, product, a PMO yeah. hat, and that PMO hat is responsible for providing a report to an exec. Sure. So that's responsible to it. It becomes an accountability mm. when you put on the hat so now I'm choosing to be accountable for that responsibility I'm wearing. Yeah. So that's the difference. So responsibility is a bit more neutral. It just is. And the accountability is the act on taking on the responsibility and saying, okay, I'm going to do it now. I'm promising to fulfill this hat in the correct fashion. Now, what the problem is, I've also heard people use the same two words in exactly the opposite direction. Mm. So it sometimes gets confusing. You do have to watch out when people talk about responsibility and accountability which version of it are they using? Exactly. But I do think the distinction is important. So a responsibility, at least in the way I use the definition, yeah. is talking about the hats and we're moving stuff around and that's just the definition. And indeed, the moment you put it on, 
you're basically telling the rest of the organization, I'm going to do my best to make all this happen. Yeah, you can be held accountable to it. Then you can be held accountable to it. Yeah. But only until you're wearing the hat, because the moment I give the hat to you, now you're accountable. Or yeah. I'm accountable. So that's the difference. But when you're in a when you're in a team, like we, we just covered a whole big part of dedication. Yeah. But dedication is like something that would be a responsibility of a team, right? Like a shared yep. responsibility. Who can then be held accountable for that? Like that's kind of a hard thing because if everyone does it, is everyone then accountable or is it only you when you put on the hat? Like, Yeah, here's here's an interesting miss of, bit of history maybe. Um, why does Scrum only have three roles? Yeah. It's an explicit choice. Mm. Um, there has been research done way back when with um, James Copeland, who's also famous from C++ and he wrote a lot of many books. Yeah. And there was a thing called the, the Bell Labs Pasteur Project. So James Copeland also did a lot of research on what types of organizations make for better organizations? Uh, how do they work? Um, you know, what are factors that do that? Now, one of the things they found that one of the most um, well, and and again to to add to that story, so they looked at many projects and they sort of made a curve and did correlations on which aspects uh, are you know better or, or are sort of predictive of their performance. And one of the projects that was at that time like super performance, it was like a very much an outlier, was the Borland Quattro Pro project. So basically when Borland was making their version of Excel. Mm. And it was like when they researched that project, it was like outperforming everything with a factor of 20. It was like insane. Ridiculous. Yeah, it was ridiculously yeah. much faster or even worse, like something like 50 or 200. It was wow. compared to like uh, all, a lot of research they did with teams like teams that were working at Microsoft at the time and, you know, mature, but, you know, why were those people so fast? Yeah, it turned out that communication saturation was the big factor. And communication saturation for us geeks is: to what extent do you look like the Borg? Mm. So, how much does every mind know everything of every other mind? So, like you know, the saturation of all the information through the whole team. Yeah. So, if you have like one bit of knowledge that is just with me, and a bit of knowledge is just with you then our communication saturation goes down. Yeah. If we both know everything of each other, then you know we have maximum communication saturation. Then they researched what's the most defining factor for the communication saturation. That turned out to be the number of roles. Mm. So the more roles you have defined, let's say you have a team of eight people, yeah. and eight people have a very defined role, and now we're talking accountability, responsibility, everybody has their separate little yeah. hat. Eight roles. Then you get that whole problem of saying, uh, oh, I'm just a tester. I did my testing job. Mm -hmm. I'm the programmer. I did my programming job. But also, what you also see, because the tester does all the testing work, that person is the only person who knows what's current the status of testing, et cetera, et cetera. So you've just partitioned your whole team in little little activity boxes little that are all segments. separated out. Yeah. So to come back to Scrum now, this is the reason why we only have three roles in Scrum. Mm. This is the reason why we only have one developer role, because they discussed that. Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland did discuss it and they said, well, should we have like a designer role? Should we have, and they explicitly said no because you don't want people to fall into that comfort zone of saying, this is my little activity box. So there has been, in the agile way of thinking, a very explicit choice to not partition everything into roles, yeah. to not give you that comfort of saying, oh, this is my little, I, I'm just a tester or I did my thing, so that the whole team can be held accountable together and you never can hide behind the fact, oh, but I did this little corner piece. Yeah. So it's an explicit choice. Does it lead to a bit more chaos? Does it lead to a bit, to a bit more, oh, oh, we need to figure out for ourselves how do we work together? Yes. And that is why we have a daily stand-up. That is why we have all these mechanisms in place to make sure that as good as possible, we catch, you could say, the potential chaos of nobody knowing what to do yeah. or everybody doing their thing or doing the same thing or duplicating efforts. Yeah, that's why the stand-up exists. Exactly. You want to make sure that there's a shared mental model that is completely exactly. shared across the members of the team. Exactly. And if you do your thing and I do yeah. my thing, then it's never going to be a shared yeah. mental model. And if you would be in an organization or a team that is completely partitioned through little activity boxes and little hats, yeah. you don't need a stand-up. No. Because everybody is directed by the little activity box, and no one cares about the other person. Then. Exactly. Yeah. So here you see that, like, if you know, maybe with with this bit of history, that explicit choice to not have any defined roles with respect to a team means that you also get a more fluid team. You get a team that doesn't hide behind their okay, I'm a, I'm a tester, 
or I'm a, especially in my case, I was a developer all the time. Yeah. But what if like 90% of the work was testing and then just watch the test or test and sweat, right? Yeah. That makes no sense doesn't from a team sense. perspective. So yeah. every person should be a skill injection into the team. But yeah. That doesn't mean you automatically comes with all kinds of accountabilities. So yeah, I mean, and there is a pro and con to it, right? I mean, if people indeed do not know what to do and just like you, I think what you're alluding to is if everybody is responsible for a thing, nobody is responsible for a thing, right? Yeah. And that's where you get in sort of the practicalities of what you see most teams do. They sort of have one person be sort of the champion of a user story, mm. right? And it's simply somebody attached to it and they just make sure that everybody else is aligned on that specific user story. Yeah. But that is also leadership that is fluid and flexible. It doesn't mean that one person, the boss person, or, you know, God forbid, the scrum master, is the boss of the execution of all those uh, of all those user stories, and then starts dictating everybody. Yeah, that wouldn't work. No, it comes from the group exactly like the example you gave, where I would be held responsible for figuring out the the date for the restaurant. Yeah, for instance. So so that handing over and the negotiation of who does what, etc. That's sort of the, the and and of course that's also why we have a limit to the team size. Yeah. It is literally not nothing other than the human condition. If we as humans were so good at communicating with each other that in the function of a team, we sort of had the power of communication to have the same style of deep communication with 15 people yeah. as we could have with five, then human team sizes would be 15. Exactly. So all our team sizes are limited by literally nothing other than our ability to have a high communication saturation with the, the maximum number of people that allows us to do that, yeah, which tends to be in that five to seven area. Exactly. I was exactly going to ask that because sometimes I feel like I am in a team and right now I'm in a bigger team. I've never yeah. been in a team this big. And I'm like, man, we have so much communication. It feels like overhead in trying to align this mental model. And yeah. it's it's right now it's still varying because we're very new and early as a team, but it takes so much extra effort it feels like because we are of this size when it comes to communication in aligning people yeah. like all sometimes we say okay we just have to document better we have to align more we have to communicate better and in my head that is only a result because we are of this size that we yeah. have to do these in my head extra things because if we were with a smaller team then that communication overhead would not be any overhead anymore because it's easier to align yeah. what you're doing than as a team yeah. and but what what is the specific size that you're in then right now i'm at like Eight, I would say. Eight. Yeah. yeah. Which is at the higher end, but I think generally, I mean, it gets really painful. I've seen when you get around, like, especially like the, the 12. Yeah, I've 13. never been there. Yeah. I've, I've even had a team where it was first time at a stand up and there were 24 people. Yeah. That is incredible. <laughs> that was, I, I, you don't know how fast I part, I sub partitioned them. Yeah. So, uh, because of that uh, trick, uh, well, uh, maybe just one step back. It also is a function of how well these people know each other. Let's mm. say those eight people have been working together for a year yeah. together. So they really know each other very well. So you also see, and that's also why I'm not so sort of religious on a specific number. Yeah. I always look at that ability of a team to really swarm together. So I've because I've seen teams of 10 work. Yeah. Why? Well, because those people had been working together for two years, knew each other in and out, and could almost communicate without speaking because they knew each other's minds so well. Yeah then you can scale up larger. They had the history of those two years. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, and even then, what you do see, the moment you get to the larger team sizes, you'd still see sort of sub-partitioning happen. Mm. And to, and this is a bit of politics. I've done it specifically at one uh, customer where I had a team of 24 people to, to, uh, to work with. Yeah. And then, so I didn't call them teams, I called them cells. Okay. So officially, for the managers from the outside, it was a team of 24 people. And I said, no, 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 there's no they're not teams, they're cells. Okay. So the, the team was, and of course they're teams. Yeah. They were, <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. This, it was just a, a nomenclature, but I found it's helpful because then there is sort of a, uh, how do you say it? The per perception that there's sort of a lightweight sub-partitioning, that's yeah. not really a team. But it did allow us to make a, just a little sort of team of teams structure uh, the internal teams just had a BA, a business analyst, as their quote-unquote product owner. Yeah. But that was mostly for clarity, doing product owner work, so the, 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 the backlog work that was necessary for that little sub-partitioning. And then the real overall product owner really was the person who was saying, okay, first this, then that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is a trick 
you may or may not use if you want to. Let's say those eight. And I, I tend to look at autonomy a lot. Mm. That's my big, if I do anything with any teams or structuring organizations, large and small, it's always around autonomy. Yeah. Because that is the most defining factor in lowering the complexity of your organization. For anybody who's a programmer, you know this, right? Yeah. Modularization, keeping the complexity of your code low. Yeah. Fun, fun fact, in human systems, it works literally exactly <laughs> the same way. I've been a software architect for a big chunk of my career. I've been literally using all my software architecture skills and knowledge about partitioning software into human systems. Love that. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. So if you're a good programmer and you know how to modularize your system, why? Uh, high cohesion, loose coupling, right? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly it. So what you want, if you look as a, like a software sort of architect or at your software system and you look at the same way as a human system, yes, you want that same level of modularization and autonomy so that you don't have all these links, you don't have the spaghetti code like with, with dependencies left and right. That's what makes also a human system so complicated. Mm. So, and so to come back to that, the subpartitioning, so yeah. when I look at subpartitionings, I always find the one that gives you the most autonomy. So if you would be sort of you you have a software monolith yeah and you want to say well I want to make two modules out of it then you think by yourself which of those the sub partitioning would make those two modules the most autonomous the most modular and that's the partitioning you take is there always like a clear partitioning that you can use like what if those 24 people are just kind of doing the same thing in a cell well then then there's less of an issue if they truly are doing the same thing because yeah. they truly have the same goal truly have what I then can, st what you can then still do, is to subpartition them in sort of like you know sub team one, sub team two, like red team, blue team, or whatever. Just give them a name, yeah. And so they can do the, exactly the same thing, but just with a smaller group of people, yeah. You know, without any other partitioning, you can still do that. And then it's sort of random as long as you sort of make sure that all the all the uh, all the skill sets are, are are covered. Yeah, that's that's what you need to do. Um, I found that as far as if I look at Autonomy, there's three things that I always look at. First is functional autonomy. Yeah. So let's say there's two connected business processes, um, like uh, mortgages. Uh, this is actually an example that I actually, oh, this is the example of that team of 20. <laughs> yeah. So uh, where you have uh, the process of getting to a mortgage is a very fundamentally separated one from the moment you have your mortgage and sort of all the updates and upkeep that goes with it as you have it. Like there are two very different things, right? Different the ones process. you bought your house, there's a lot of work that goes into actually, you know, getting the agreement, getting your contract, getting your money, and all that kind of thing until you have the mortgage. But then you're sort of it's it's sort of stable, right? Yeah. All you need to do is some interest updates or things like that. So also the company was essentially partitioned into these two different pieces. But this team that I had was mostly about reporting. Yeah. And the reporting they had to do across the whole company. But since the business processes were so distinct, we subpartitioned two of the teams to be one for this process and one for that process, which made total sense because the, the reports that they made were completely separated from each other. They had nothing to do with each other. So that's yeah. functional autonomy. The second one is technical autonomy. Mm. So uh, to what extent do you have your own technical stack? Yeah. And then of course it's nice if you have your own thing. So you know if you have, can you run on your own cloud instance? Yeah, you know that would be one form of autonomy, uh, or are you using shared libraries? Are you working on the same infrastructure? Things yeah. like that. So, the m the more in the more autonomous you can get, that the better. And it's always not optimal, or you can generally not fully do it. But you know how close how close can you get it? That's one. And the final one is what I say: uh, personal autonomy. Mm. Do we have all the skill sets we need? And so there you get into trouble where there's this one person who is the only one who has the knowledge about this field of knowledge or this technical thing. Yeah. And then you have to share them across teams. And those are the people you need to figure out, you know, how do we share them? How do we How do you make that scale? How do we make sure that for instance this people this person is in this team but then apprentices, you know, somebody else? Yeah. Uh, things like that. But those are the three things I look for. So functional autonomy, technical autonomy, personal autonomy. And that's then how I make my choices. Interesting. I've I've seen technical autonomy probably a lot, also functional, but technical autonomy also gone wrong. Where oh, yeah. there's a where there's a responsibility and another responsibility, but there's so much coupling in between yep. that all of a sudden there's communication overhead there. Yep. And then the end result is almost exactly the same as if if you would have it in the same team, except yep. that team would then be autonomous completely. Yep. 
So the best you can hope for is to maximize it. Yeah. Right? So to let's say if the, the there's a, there's a lot of like you say it's technical debt in a sense, right? And sure. But you still are able to achieve. Okay, we're still on the same platform, but we at least we have functional autonomy. Yeah. That's better than than not having that. Yeah. So in just in, in practical fact, you'll never get there one hundred percent. You get as close as you can get, and then sort of you continue further building it out. I was also um, 2012 and 2013. I was at uh, TomTom, mm. and it was interesting that they had component teams there for the whole navigation core. Yeah. And normally we all say no, feature teams are for component teams are bad. It should be feature teams and blah blah blah. But there, specifically there, uh, when I discussed it with the architects and also with the leader for the navigation core, I said no, no, no. This is actually a good idea. Why? Because just because the way they had built it out, yeah. because you know at that time they did a massive effort, etc. And just through history and legacy, it became a big monolith. Mm. You know, just like with any other software, this can happen for all kinds of reasons. But they were doing a massive effort to decouple everything, to take all those modules and pull them apart. Now, the interesting thing is, all those component teams were essentially very nicely mapped onto the modules you'd like. Yeah, And so there was also a natural tendency for all those teams to start to pull their own code out of the monolith. So if we would have had feature teams, would that process have been as strong? Yeah. I I think not. So what I advise them is to keep it like this up until you think the, the core is fully partitioned and then only start thinking about component teams. Because there was a natural drive for all of those teams to achieve technical autonomy. Yeah, that that's so interesting to me because like if you would read online like what the best way to split a team is like obviously it's context dependent but what you might have might already be better than what is out there given your set of circumstances yeah. and your own context right yeah but then how how do you know because it's really hard to compare the the what if scenario versus the <laughs> what you already have scenario right um again you know uh, if you have software development uh, how do you know a module is autonomous uh, yeah. is is modular it's the loose coupling thing right yeah it's it, high cohesion, loose coupling. It's, it's literally that. Just look at your teams. Do you see them being highly cohesive within the team? And do you see them have nicely loose coupling without with other teams? Yeah. That's what you're looking for. So if you see two teams constantly need to communicate because there is some technical dependency in testing or the infrastructure. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Or yeah. at least it's an impediment and you put stuff on the backlog and you start fixing it, right? And to, to start you know maximizing the, the uh, it even more. So that's also how I judge the choices. To what extent, just like you would have a software module and you're constantly seeing connections going all over the place and it's tied like you, you know, if you look at your import statements yeah. and you see like a gazillion imports both ways, you know something's Sounds wrong. Exa- like, yeah, exactly. It's, it's really that. It's, it's like, you know, trying to, for instance, like uh, make sure that you don't have circular dependencies. But that also, you know, somewhat goes for human uh, systems. It's not that bad. I mean, it's not, not like software in that sense. Mm. But it has a similar feel to it. Yeah. Like, you know, sort of how many import statements does one team have towards another team? Interesting. Uh-huh. And that's what you try to avoid. I love that. So well, you're, if you're a software guy, you, you know how to, <laughs> you, you're, it's easy. Like, you'll, be, you'll be pretty good. Agile is so easy, man. Uh, that's interesting. Like one of the final thoughts I had in my head, we talked a lot about dedication or dedicated teams, autonomous teams, and even how you could, split the autonomy to where it makes sense, right? High cohesion, loose coupling. Yeah. Have you had a set of circumstances where you created a dedicated team or a dedicated organization or used the delegation canvas to do that and the sanitation canvas to sanitize all the responsibilities yep. away time-wise? And then throughout the years reflected back on that to see if they stuck to that or if they've evolved that or if they've gone back to like old behavior? Uh, I wish I'd known that for all the cases because this is of <laughs> course the curse of being a consultant, right? It's very yeah. often... You know, by the time the money's finished or everything is sort of going smoothly, your job is done. Yeah, you've moved on. Yeah, you've moved on. And then, uh, you know, how many times do you really have the time or do you take the time to really go to that old customer and call them and go like, oh, yeah, how's it going? I would love to know. Yeah. uh, So it's it's very, this is actually something that has nothing to do with, actually with, you could say the quote unquote technical choices that were made with respect to structure and responsibilities. Yeah. This is only a question that I've all only seen answered. Like, do they fall back into old behavior or, or old structures or does it go wrong? It's only leadership. It's only culture. That's mm. literally the only thing. 
because any organization that does their agile and maybe you know it might not go well for a while or yep. they might fall to their knees or fall on their face but any agile organization will then go oh you know something went wrong you know we started we do retros yeah. we improve it etc get back up and you'll you'll fix it again so the organizations that where you see it really go wrong was always the ones where let's say there was a change of leadership that change of leadership didn't believe in agile anymore they killed it they killed it and then game over yeah start from zero yeah and that is so, really sad yeah and so but as far as um an organization that does believe in it and one of the organizations i know that sense the best is uh, bull.com mm. when i i was t- together with two other consultants we were we were involved in just changing the it department of that time into full scrum that was 2009 yeah and um and i've stuck with them for about one and a half years so one half year was like the the initial transition. So at that time there were eight teams, and by now they're like fifty. I mean, it's crazy. The scale is like beyond. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, and also I stuck around so the year afterwards because it was more the portfolio, like the collaboration of teams, kind of a thing. How do you scale? That was sort of my first big assignment where I had to figure out like how do how do I get eight teams to collaborate? Right. So it wasn't really a very well known thing. Nowadays we have the frameworks, but the frameworks didn't exist at the time. Yeah. So we're sort of you know. We sort of bootstrapped it ourselves, and, and we came to pretty close um, uh, conclusions, and it worked pretty well. But um, nowadays, and I've I've spoken with some some of the people I still have some contact with every once in a while, and they they continued with their path. Mm. But that was always uh, because there was a full belief in you know, you know this is the way it should go. We should go agile, and they they just continued doing it yeah and did they do it do it perfectly of course not right they no. also told me there were moments where they fell back and uh, you know that there were weird things happening or like with any real organization nobody's perfect but what's interesting is that they also did some amazing extra stuff like um they actually pulled in sort of sociocratic ideas things like holacracy and they made their own system i believe they called spark Mm. where they said well all the agile teams are working like it teams they want to really work scrum etc but we sort of want a different feel for our more business oriented teams okay and they then use that more sociocratic system uh, to to work with that so they even evolved and changed it now that never could have happened if you would have had a a, a management layer because that's still i mean that's still the reality we live in right I yeah mean, it's still leaders who in the end say this is the way we do things around here I mean, yep. in the end, that's just sim- that's simply how our world works. So, yeah, would that ever have happened if there was a management change and they would say, "Lad, that agile thing, we don't think it's nice and just kill the whole thing? It would have been killed. Yeah. So, and that's literally, you know, the only thing. And I've also heard that sometimes they, they you know, they, they fell back to other things. They had tr- struggles. Things sort of went back some steps and they went forward again. Um but that's, I think, very normal for any organization. I mean, even like, you know, with our organization here, like with, with things EBR, right? We we also have our moments that we do dumb shit and just, you know, <laughs> do things in the stupid <laughs> way. pick or, it back up, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's also the power of our organization, right? The proactivity, the fact that people just, you know, step forward and do the things that they need to do or, you know, have an opinion. And uh, it's not, well, because, well, well, who are you, right? It's not now the person with the opinion. And if it's if it makes sense, it's like, oh, yeah, good idea. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to me that it's an interesting perspective, right? That the leadership vision trickles down into the organization and then that is a way where it would fall back into old behavior or to just throw everything that you've built up in the trash and start from scratch. Yeah. Although I w- there's three things. Again, I always say three things. <laughs> three things. Trend. It's always a yeah. thing, like three things. Uh, when I talk to leadership and what, what their responsibility, like, like top level leadership, like executive leadership, what their yeah. responsibilities are, I always say essentially sort of product ownership at the highest level. So a team is a team by grace of a common goal, right? Yeah. Well, that applies to the whole company, right? However, are, is a team going to feel like they're cohesive and they belong together if they don't have a shared goal together? <laughs> so they're sort of product owners at the highest level, which then translates to strategy and mission and vision, all that kind of stuff. But that's really what they are. Scrum Master side, same thing. They are the place where sort of the buck stops when there is an impediment that... Maybe it takes like a fundamental restructuring of the HR house of job functions. Yeah. Well, 
you know, you'd have to be a pretty flat organization if somebody just anywhere could say, oh, let's restructure it. It tends to be the big boss who needs to say yes. So that's one of those other things. So they tend to be sort of the place where the buck stops with respect to the most high-level impediments. But the third one, and that's the one I want to, want to talk about here, is I call them, I say, you're also the keepers of the culture, which is very similar to parenting in that sense. Let's say, you know, you have a kid, and the kid, uh, you know, uh, there's there's the cat, and then the, the, it's like a small baby and starts to pull on the tail of the cat. Yeah. Well, you know, this is also my personal experience. What does your child do? They look up at you going like, is this okay? They yeah. sort of smile, go like, is this okay? Yes or no? They want, you, they want to see you laugh. Exactly, because you are the reference for, is this behavior okay? They're looking for that, okay, is this all right or not? And in that sense, this is where you see that's very important. Like most of the time, mm. leadership doesn't even have to have a vision. They just need to say, sort of nod and go, yes, this is the way we do things around here. Yeah. So then, and they, they like to hear that. I also say, you're the keepers of the culture. And the way things are done around here, because that's, I think I like this very simple definition of culture. Culture is the way we do things around here. Mm. That, that's it, right? That's simply a definition of, of culture. So if even if they don't know how to do agile, for instance, I tell leadership, all you need to do is just nod whenever I say that's agile. Yeah. And if they truly believe in it and trust it and say, yeah, okay, I believe in the thing, don't know how it works. I don't even really have a vision about it, but I do think it's important. I trust that person to do it then all they really need to go is go, yes, that's the way we do things around here. Or when somebody else comes in and is like, yeah, that agile thing is stupid and we need this report and we need other, and then it sort of, you know, it's it's conflicting. It doesn't work, it's conflicting and doesn't work really well, that that leader then goes like, no, 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 but that's the way we do things around here now. Yeah. So go figure it out. Which is a fundamentally different message from, well, yeah, I don't know, hmm, would it be okay? What do you think? Yeah, exactly. Sort of, or, or yeah, 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 that report is really important. Well, maybe we should be, you know, doing our project tracking based on hours, because uh-huh, otherwise I don't know what my budgets are that I want to burn. And so, you know, that's a very fundamentally different thing. So I found that in all the cases when, you know, Agile did, did or did not work in the end, yeah, it was always that keeper of the culture thing. Always. That's very powerful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Incredibly. Yeah. I've loved this conversation so far, Sergio, when it comes to <laughs> dedicated teams and, and autonomous teams as well, your take on everything. Is there still something in there that you would like to add before we round off? Uh, let's see, because of course I had, we, we, <laughs> we talked about it before we had notes here. I think we, we, we talked about dedication. We talked about common goal, autonomy, ecosystem. I think maybe two things that I, one thing I would like to emphasize is that, um, when you have about when you talk about effective teams, yeah, I fully believe that if you have a list of impediments of that team, why are they not functioning? That ninety to ninety-five percent of that list is not the team itself; it's their ecosystem. Mm. It's the organizational sanity around them. So many times I've been sent at the team, going like, "They're a bunch of idiots. They're not functioning. Go fix them." And then it turns out that when you really start looking into it, oh, wait a minute, the testing environment is never available. The requirements are never clear. Yeah, people people are getting pulled in and out of the team by somewhere else. Oh, there's this manager or the sales guy constantly coming in from the side and disrupting the the, the behavior of the team, etc., etc., cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything around it. Yeah, and then I don't know how many times then also you know in the cases where it really worked. I mean, of course, you know you're never guaranteed to have a success, but where it really worked, that then those managers would ask me like, okay, you know, how did you do that? Mm. And I said, well, nothing. I just made sure they could do their job. Yeah, because the people never really changed. They just, you know, they were sort of, you know, just took away all the impediments because that's the fundamental sort of lean, agile way of thinking. People are fundamentally awesome. You just need to take away the impediments that pre- prevent them from functioning. Yeah, and they did their thing. Yeah, so that's also what one thing I think is important. Also, again, that's also why it's so important for a leadership thing because so many times the people in those teams don't have the mandate in our still our hierarchical world to actually fix the things that need to be fixed. So that's also where uh, it's irresponsible. And the fifth thing I had, we had on our list that we discussed also before is psychological safety. Yeah. Right? And that is also one of those ecosystem things because the reason you feel safe or not is a function of the culture, it's a function of the ecosystem, it's a function of leadership, it's the function of the behavior and also the example behavior of, of leaders or people you look up to, or people who are your reference, because let's say you know somebody is your boss, and that's the person who in the end gives you your salary. Yeah, their behavior will influence you. Absolutely. I mean, it will. I mean, you you can't deny that. So I'd say sort of this combination of both looking at the ecosystem, 
but also making sure that the psychological safety is there because how otherwise will you know we were talking about you know this whole discussion earlier where we were talking about sort of that swarming effect and having a com- conversation of who does what yeah how's that ever going to happen if you're scared yeah it just won't you're not going to say anything yeah so that's uh, again another quote i i use a lot in in my work i also say fear is the great killer mm. so if people are are afraid in a team or in an organization anywhere yeah just game over yeah that's it yeah just game over because people will have very weird behavior um and it's always like and i've also learned to recognize in in this sense especially if you're a bit less experienced and you have somebody you encounter and they have like what you would call quote unquote insane behavior sort mm-hmm. of in a business context right like why are you doing that Wicked. it makes no sense there is always a reason underlying it yeah that makes sense and it is very often based in fear. Okay. So I'm like I'm worried that my higher up manager will kick my ass. I'm exactly. very worried that this that this release will not go out the door and I'm so worried about it that I'm getting this control behavior because that's sort of the way I deal with my own stress. Yeah. So um as maybe that's as as far as a bit of advice is concerned, if you see that kind of a thing happening, empathy is going to be your biggest weapon in that sense or your biggest ally figuring out what's underlying that behavior. Why are you doing that? What are your goals? What are your fears? And then speak to those because very often you can then fix a thing instead of just trying to fix the system and sort of going like, go away, go away, kind of. That, <laughs> yeah. That won't work. Why are you constantly coming to me? Why are you constantly bothering me? Why are you so worried about this? Yeah. And then having the conversation about the actual fear that they have and saying, okay, this is how I'm going to address your direct fear. That helps a lot. Yeah, it takes the underlying pain, underlying pain away. Yeah. And again, a lot of my work tends to be sort of identifying that and going like, "Hey, interesting." So, sort of, I always, I've, le- I've taught myself to never go like, "Oh, you know, that that person is an idiot," yeah. but to always have the response, "How interesting." So, I love that. <laughs> I think I've taken I've taken note of that, and yeah. I do that <laughs> as well. How interesting! Yeah. yeah, cool. We're gonna round it off here, everyone. Sergio Beaumont. I'm gonna put all his socials in the description below. Check him out. Let him know you came from our show. And with that being said, thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one.